Uh, okay, um, I continue with merging in 3D. So we have um, yesterday processed uh, a few tilted images of this glib F data set, um, six tilted images. Um, we have um, Priyanka Abirakne, so has um, written this article, which is um, has appeared in a book of um, comprehensive biophysics that Ed Eagleman has uh, edited. It's a very big book, and it appeared in April this year, a few months ago. And Priyanka wrote this article. I mentioned that before. Um, and in this article, there is. Um, is the table of all these protein structures that had been determined with membrane proteins of, and with 2D crystals. And this table lists 500 or so entries. Um, and they are sorted by the type, ion channels, potassium channels, and so on. The resolution that was obtained from 2D crystals in 2D projection maps or in 3D structures. And if it was an atomic structure, then there was a PDB entry. And then it lists all the conditions, um, how these crystals were obtained, um, buffer conditions, pH, temperature, and in the end, the reference. And to, to, to compile this table, um, we had to read 500 papers about 2D crystals and find all these conditions. And this was shared by many people that are among the authors. So maybe 10 or so people um, each took over a certain section of publications and we compiled all this list. Um, what is very interesting and also frustrating to see is how many cases there are where people got some decent resolution of 2D crystals in projection maps and when this was and then how long it took. So this, how long it took to go to 3D. So 1998, there was a six angstrom projection map of KCSA and never a 3D structure because the X-ray structure came out of this one. But there are also many other cases um, where people got to decent resolution in 2D projection maps and um, maybe five years later the first 3D map appeared or never. Yeah, so here projection maps 3.2 angstrom, no 3D structure. Projection map 6 angstrom, no 3D structure. There are many examples like that. Um, and this, I think, is mostly due to technical problems. It's easy to take projection pictures and to calculate projection maps, as we have done uh, before. Um, but usually to learn the MRC programs took PhD students about two years. And if you have a three-year PhD, then the first year you make your crystal, the second year you record the pictures, the third and fourth year you learn how to use the software, and then you publish a projection map, and then you leave. Right? And that's, I think, how most of these cases came to exist. And so with 2DX, our mission was to change this <clears throat> so that when you have a 2D data set, then a few months later, you should have a 3D data set. And everything that stands behind these two papers should just be technical stuff that should be um, as easy and user-friendly as it is with X-ray crystallography. So this is why we tried to make this accessible in the 2DX package. Um, the 3D merging capabilities in the 2DX package exist since a few years, but um, we also, in, in our group, had to learn how to do the 3D merging. And it was a slow learning process for me and my colleagues. Um, and it went hand in hand with our own progress on structure determination. And in our lab now, we have, I think, five structures that made it into a 3D map. Um, we are around five to seven angstroms with these maps. and. Um, we do this all in 2DX always, and we have implemented everything that we used and needed into 2DX, and this works now relatively straightforward, and we will try this all this afternoon. Uh, we have not yet reached 3 angstrom resolution, so there are some tricks that we need to do to go to 3 angstrom resolution, which we don't know yet, and so far we haven't implemented that. So if any of you manages to go to something that isn't working well or is, is not yet implemented in 2DX, we would be more than thankful if you would just tell us, well, actually you need to do this and that here and use the other program and then CC4 you have to do this and that, um, which is not yet in there. Then we will include that in 2DX and acknowledge you as co-authors on the next publication or also in the scripts and say this was contributed by so-and-so, for example. Yeah? 
Um, Anshi Chen contributed several things. That's all in there. Um, Pierre Bullo contributed how to deal with all these different um, tilt geometries, uh, the symmetries. Yeah. So if you open 3DX image and uh, try to symmetrize something, there's this space B. There's one script that uh, we use to translate from the um, space group number. We have 17 space groups into different um, nomenclatures. This script here, um, you give this the space group P4, and then it returns the name of P4 in all the different worlds and what applies to this. So P4 symmetry, P4 for symmetry, in MRC is number 10, and in CCP4, P4 has the name 79 or 75, but there's also different uh, table of definitions. And then there is a very interesting table of um, in what symmetry you have what uh, symmetry constraints. Um, it's a longer story. And then Per Bolo sat down and wrote for each symmetry a little paragraph in an email that he sent to us. It said, okay, for the symmetry P2, there is this and that happening and there's here a symmetry and there sometimes you have to for the non-tilted pictures, restrict the phases to 0 or 180. And for each case, he wrote some text. And we put this all into the script, all just as comments. Um, and then the script goes in and says, okay, you say your symmetry is P4. Then we set the space group number to 10 and the um, CCP4 symmetry number is 75 and, and so on. So there is the script that has where we assembled all information about um, symmetries. Um, and this is from Per Bolo, this text. Yeah. And so here we just, we just state where this comes from. And Richard Henderson told us things about how the tilt geometry is, uh, is defined, and this is also in there. And if you happen to find something that is missing, please let us know. So, now for 3D merging. Um, the story is always the same. Uh, we record pictures of tilted crystals. Each crystal is only photographed once. The new camera may change that, the direct electron camera, but as long as you work with film, because you want to have the noise from the film or the scanner only once, for each crystal you take only one picture. So you set three crystals at 60 degrees, and then you take from one crystal one picture, and then you go to the next crystal and take another picture. And since all these 60 degree uh, grids have crystals in different orientation on there, um, the distorted projection maps will correspond to different central section planes in Fourier space. And by combining all that, we can, for each lattice line, have many measurement points along these. And the merging step is now to take all these pictures, process them, and in Fourier space, then uh, do this lattice line fitting. And when you have amplitudes and phases determined for each lattice line, then you can use CCP4 to make a 3D reconstruction. This is fairly abstract, and you have to be able to use MRC programs and electron microscopy and CCP4. And so and this is, I think, this reason why there were so many 2D projection maps published that never made it into 3D. So the key program is Auric Tilt from the MRC package. And Auric Tilt um, is the central program that uh, it takes all the um, diffraction data from all your pictures and makes one big assembly out of that, one merged data set. And for each picture, it receives information about that picture. It receives the amplitude and phase file from one image and then it wants to know um, what was the tilt axis and the tilt angle for that picture, um, and where's the phase origin for that picture, and what was the kilovolts, and uh, maybe also the beam tilt for that one micrograph, and the resolution limits, and so And it gets all this information and uh, generates one big file that is called Merge APH. Um, and we had this when we spoke about 2D merging, this is now for 3D. So Auric Tilt creates this merge APH file, 
And this is now a collection of all informations from all images into one big file. Um, so, and in this file, the reflections are sorted by their H and K indices, and the reflection one zero, the first one, the red dot in the Fourier transformation, without any tilt, so the Z star information is zero still, has in this case, in this example, five measurements from five different pictures, and they all have an amplitude and a phase and also a background amplitude. Um, and then you can calculate an IQ value or a weight or a CPF value. And this is all put into one big uh, image, big file. And you do this for all reflections, it's a long file. And if you have tilted images, then there's also different Z star values. So in this case, the reflection 2, 0 um, was found a few times in the horizontal plane, but a few times also already with a little bit of tilt, and then the Z star value starts to be a little bit higher, uh, 0 0.0013 or 0, 0, 0 0.0024 or so, and you go slowly up with measurements up on a lattice line. So this is auric tilt. And then um, in 3D, the goal is now to, to have all these measurements and make a lattice line out of that. And Anshi explained us what the lattice lines are yeah, and how the sink fitting is used to get in the end some smooth interpolation of your lattice line measurements for amplitudes and phases yeah, and how to equidistantly interpolate that so that you get your HKL data in the end that you can hand over to CCP4 to make your 3D map. Before you do that, you have to calibrate your data. If you, they come from different pictures, some pictures have a lot of contrast because the water and ice was thin, and other pictures have little contrast because there was a lot of ice on it or the carbon film was thicker. And you have to somehow bring all these different measurements to the same contrast and intensity. And this lead line pre-scaling program does that. So it takes the output from auric tilt, this merge APH file, and generates a pre-scaled uh, similar file. Um, but now um, the, um, the amplitudes, for example, are averaged from several spots. So this one zero non-tilted um, was a few times there and now it's averaged into one amplitude and one phase. And there's also the intensities of different micrographs scaled together. So the two zero spot non-tilted um, is now listed a few times. Um, and you can't see from which micrograph this comes anymore. And I don't right now understand why you have several data here. Um, yeah, I don't actually know this at the moment. So the next program then is Latline, and Latline takes the output of Latline prescale and does the actual lattice line interpolation using the parameters as Anshi um, explained that. Anshi, can you just help me out? What is Latline prescale doing exactly? Do you, do you remember that? Yeah, but you still have the different reflection. For each one, you have different micrographs. Yeah, it, it doesn't really, um, I don't think it does according to the micrograph. That part is not good. It probably does that. Um, part of it has to change in the order of the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the workflow is auric tilt, then lead line is prescale, and then lead line. And lead line does this lattice line interpolation. And it takes the non-evenly spaced 
um, values. So here, for example, the reflection 2.0, we have entries in the Z star height at 0 0.0013 or 0 0.0016 and um, 1.9 and 2.4 and 3.5 and 4.4. Those are non-evenly spaced. Yeah, it's just wherever they, they happen to be measured at, at a certain lattice line, depending on how your crystals were oriented in your microscopes, you have different non-evenly spaced measurements for these for this lattice line 2.0, that's the name of the lattice line. And lead line then takes these non-evenly spaced uh, values and creates equally spaced output data. Um, so the 2.0 lattice line is now measured at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, equally spaced. And this is after interpolation of these lattice lines and then reading it, writing it out in equal distances. And for each of these, you have an amplitude and a phase and a sigma of the amplitude and the sigma of the phase and the figure of merit, which is the cosinus of the sigma of the phase. So, and this is still in H and K and Z star, but Z star is now at least equally spaced. And then this can be translated into H and K and L of the next program, prepare for um, this LCF format. LCF is an older format for CCD4. And this is now, the lattice lines are now spaced as um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you have HKL, which is uh, CCD4 syntax. And you have an amplitude and a phase and a figure of merit for this. Um, and this is then handed over to CCD4 to make a 3D um, map out of that. So, um, We write, we call this program PREP MKLCF two times. Once we call it to make a file that is called um, LUT fitted, no symmetry applied.hkl. And this is used to make a map. It has a figure of merit in the end. And we also create a second file that is called LUT fitted ref.hkl. Um, and this um, is used as a reference for further refinement circle, cycles. And this has a sigma, sig A uh, column still present um, because this is needed by some programs to, to do refinement. And what is refined, I will come to that later. So we have two output files that where the difference is just the presence of this last column or not. And all this is on this website, 2dx.org. Um, on this website, we have um, in the documentation section, we have the data flow. And in the data flow, there are these um, processing for one image or merging in 2D or merging in 3D section. And if you go to the merging in 3D section, you have here the order of programs, how they are called one after the other and what the files should look like. And I recommend you to just double click on these names in 2DX Merge and look at them and see if this is actually also more or less looking in the same way. If you have stars here, because you're, that sometimes happens in Fortran, your numbers are too large or too low, or you have just zeros somewhere, then you know that something went wrong. But you can just look at these and say, well, okay, so this seems to, to calculate something. Yeah? Maybe you find things that look funny. And all these problems, one after the other, that are called by 2DX Merge for 3D um, processing, they are listed here in this order. <clears throat> I think we compiled this table half a year or a year ago, and the scripts may have changed a little bit concerning how we symmetrize data. This is before can symmetrize also. But in general, there should be a workflow how data is handed from one program to the next one, and here's where you can find examples how these look like, and also you find um, descriptions of what these columns are. And I hope we got this all right, but sometimes um, other people can help us with additional information. So the processing for non-tilted was this algorithm, and for tilted was this, with this tilted transfer function. And for, yeah, we had this before. And then here now, for the 3D merging, we do this processing for each image, and in the end, 
merge this all together to make a 3D map in the end. Um, and for 2D merging, we discussed this yesterday, how you set the modus of 2DX merge to 2D, and then you choose one image as reference, align the others onto it, and determine the phase origins that they are all identically oriented, and then calculate an average, the final merge and the merge 2D projection map. We did this yesterday. And now for 3D merging, um, you set the modus to 3D, um, that enables other functions and these scripts. And now there is this parameter Z star win, um, which I need to, which I would like to explain. Um, that parameter is here at the bottom, Z star win. And maybe I am missing this, I forgot to put this figure in. So our problem is the following. So we want to, we have a 3D Fourier space um, in X, Y, and Z. So Z is, in, so X and Y and Z, this is, um, or I call this U and V and W. So this is the vertical axis. And in the 3D Fourier space so far, we have only non-tilted data, which we produced yesterday. Our non-tilted data, they occupy only the horizontal plane. Yeah, we have all these high resolution and low resolution data in the non tilted plane. Now we want to collect data in the vertical direction. And now, if you have one image, and this one image um, in Fourier space, U and W, and Y is in this direction, this one image happens to be 45 degree tilted. So, this is 45 degree tilted crystal. Fungal is 45. Um, now we want to put this in here and start having a third dimension. And then we put all our different tilt angles in there and in the end we have this all populated. Yeah? Um, we need to determine the phase origin for this tilted picture. And you can see in the image that the tilted picture will look different. Non-tilted we have these nice little squares and the central one stands on the tip and the other one is falling to the right. The tilted images look a little bit different from the side, this protein looks different. Alpha helices from the top show you dots and from the sides show you lines. And then it will be a challenge to find out which of the two tetramers is the one that stands on the tip and the other one on the side. But if you get some experience or also later the program can do that, then you find that out. But still, to calculate um, the phase origin, what, what you want to do in real space is you have your, your reference and you want to cross-correlate this with, with this one image. Yeah, so your, your reference is, is this and the image may be this. And you want to find out that you need to shift this a little bit so that it's perfectly centered. Yeah? And this uh, cross-correlation um, is calculated in Fourier space. You have your reference. This is the reference. So far only 2D and this is our tilted image. And we need to um, cross-collate this with that. This is done by multiplication in Fourier space. Um, and then see where it fits best. And the problem is now, if you calculate a cross-collation between a tilted image and the non-tilted reference, this is the tilted image, and this is the non-tilted reference, the only values that you can actually multiply with each other are this, these ones that are exactly on the tilt axis. And this is so little overlap that you get no signal at all. And in the end, if you try to do this, the programs will tell you there were from these 300 reflections in this image and from these 500 reflections in your reference, there were three used to determine the phase origin. And those were the three here exactly in the middle because all the others were just not in the same space and they couldn't be compared with each other. Um, so the problem is that as long as you have a 2D image and a tilted image, there's no nothing in common, and so you can't really find out what the line them with the computer. And to um, solve this dilemma, we temporarily tell the program when you have your reference value and you want to look, um, so you have an image value here and you look for some comparison data in your 
reference, um, just use a very large um, tolerance so that you compare these pixels with, so with those. So if you have here a measurement compared with this one, if you have here a measurement compared with this one, and so these, these are compared and these are compared, and, and also these are compared, if you just give it a tolerance. So this tolerance um, region is called Z-start window. Yeah? So this is Z-star window, which originally in the MRC software was called just Z-star, and there's also a different Z-star, so there were, it was the same name for two different things, so we called one Z-star window. So what you effectively do is you have a 2D reference and you want to merge um, or refine your first tilted image into that, and you can only do this if you set your Z-star window to something very large. So the first time we set this to 0 0.5, which is the full space. And then the computer can take a tilted picture and compare it with a non-tilted reference by just um, uh, being very generous in the vertical direction. And then you have information and you can try to find a face origin and then you can align your tilted image onto a non-tilted reference. So the first time we set this Z-star window to 0 0.5 and then we align our tilted images to that and they are all aligned and we do this with, with many and in the end we have all these tilted images yeah, that are all there and the next time we want to refine the face origins um, the next time our 3D Fourier space looks like this. This is the horizontal axis, this is the vertical axis, and now we have lots of data in, in our 3D Fourier space from all our tilted images. Yeah, so we now have all this already populated, all these lattice lines here are populated. So, because our tilted images are all in there already. And now if we have one tilted image and want again to compare this with that, and it comes for example here, we have lots of com comparisons. Um, so now it's easy to compare this measurement with the same location. You don't need this vertical tolerance anymore. And then you set this Z-star window to something small. And in the end, it should be 1 divided by 2 times the ALAT variable, the vertical dimension of your crystal. It's technical, we will apply this this afternoon, um, but it's one step you have to think about. And the first time you do a 3D merging, you need to improve, increase this tolerance value, Z star window to 0 0.5 in the beginning, and later you make it smaller. Um, so, we come back to this this afternoon. So, Z-star window to a large value, like 0 0.5, so the tilted images can use non-tilted data as reference. Then you refine once to align all tilted images onto your non-tilted reference. And then you generate these final maps again and look at them and see if that makes sense to you. For our data set from yesterday, we had the non-tilted images all nicely aligned, exactly the same. And then we have these six tilted images and... Um, so this tetramer stands on its tip and this one falls to the left in this case here. So this one stands on the tip, this falls to the left, this one stands on the tip, this falls to the left. They should make sense, hopefully. And if, yeah. So here I can also, I think I see a square that stands on the tip and here I see the square a little bit falling to the left. Yeah, so this one I also believe. Here I'm not so sure. This one maybe is correct. Yeah. So you should just look at these final maps and see if they make sense. If you look at these in uh, 2DX Merge, you also see them, if you move to that, you see them a bit magnified here, and the tilt axis, taxa, is, is plotted as a line, and taxa should be perpendicular to the smear that you see. Yeah? Other helices from the side show up as lines, and, um, well, if this is the tilt axis and you tilt it like that, then it makes sense that you see these lines. If you see these kinds of lines, because you look at alpha helices from the side and the tilt axis is some, in some other direction, then something is wrong. 
Yeah. And in, in our lab uh, here in Basel, with Andreas Engel, as Professor Simon Scheuring was, he's in Marseille now, AFM. He was the person with the best eye, and he just walked by and looked at it and said, your tilt axis is wrong. He just had this eye for this. You could show him whatever structure that you have never seen before, and within a second he would tell you where the tilt axis is. He was always right. He had this excellent eye for that. So, you look at your maps and you verify this, and when you start to trust them, then you merge everything together once in 3D. And then you have already a 3D merged data set. And then you set your Z-star tolerance now to something small uh, and do this refine again and merge and refine and merge and refine 10 or 20 times until the face origins don't change anymore, until the pictures don't move anymore. Um, now, if you can set the Z-stars to something small, the Z-star window, you would compare a tilted image actually only with its tilted structure and not with the entire thing. So the face origins can get better here. And then you can regenerate these image maps and verify this again. And in the end, you do one final merging. And in principle, you are done. But then the question is, is this correct what you have? So then you, you after the final merging, you have to look at these lattice lines. You can do this also earlier. And apply what we learned from Anchi. Then you generate the final 3D map and you look at it with Chimera and you start to do biology and interpret what you have, hopefully. So I showed you the data flow. For this lattice line interpolation, Anchi explained these parameters, R min and R max, del pro, del plot, um, bin size. Um, I will watch Anchi's uh, lecture a few more times on the internet. They will be, if they're recorded, they will be on the internet and I will try to learn that and take notes and understand more what these parameters are. Um, they are all used by one script in Final Merge, which is uh, using that line, to do the lattice line interpolation using these parameters. And you can also look at the Fortran program's header, at least, uh, where it's also again explained what these parameters are. And also on our webpage, we have this book chapter that Anchi and Vincent Unger wrote once, um, where it's also explained what this means. Um, there are also a few more parameters here that influence the behavior of this lattice line fitting. Um, here's an application. This is one of our proteins. Um, I don't have power, so. Um, so here is, is a data set that is, has non-tilted images. Um, it's an ion channel, 15 degree tilted, 30 degree tilted, um, 45 degree tilted. Yeah, and you can go through these um, final merge. Would merge these all together. What Z star window do I have now for the um, the refine? Uh, what is the Z star? I'm using here. And where is it anyway? Here, 0 0.00125. It's small because it's all refined already. So you do this final merge, you merge this all together, and in this merging, there are these parameters. And we tried things and tried to fit them as good as we can, but can improve this now. Um, there are also these uh, merge IWF and IWP, which uh, let the program decide based on what um, the merging, the, the lattice line fitting should should be optimized using um, where the weights should come from. Uh, so, and in the end, you have your lattice line plot. And the lattice line plot is here. If you double click this, you open it and then look at this and you have then these two sections for amplitudes and phases. This would be the lattice line zero 01. It's a very short one because it's close to the origin. Yeah, so this is a very short one. Yeah? The, the higher resolution lattice lines are longer. The first ones are short because we can't tilt higher than, in this case, 45 degrees. 
And then you can look through these lattice lines and see if, if they make sense or if they're completely nonsense. Um, yeah, they, they should have some error bars that are not too big. So here, this is this would be just random. This horizontal axis is the vertical direction, right? So we start from this zero, from the center, we go up on the lattice line 110, we go up in the vertical direction. And you have the phase information and the amplitude information. Um, the phases usually look better from images and the amplitudes look worse because the CTF correction isn't so precisely done yet. Um, the size of these crosses depends on the IQ value. If you have a big cross um, that was an IQ2 spot or so, and if you have a small dot that was an IQ4 spot, I, here we used um, all spots up to IQ5 including. If you have a very strong spot that is completely, especially for the phases, that is completely out of your fitting. So here is one spot that is very strong and the phase is nevertheless completely outside of what otherwise the others say, then it would be worth trying to find out which one this is. And what we would need is a possibility to double click on that one spot and it should tell us this spot is picture number 6553 and it's the reflection uh, with those, it's the reflection 115 um, and the phase is wrong. So probably the, the CTF correction did, um, was wrong here by 180 degrees. It should be down here, not there. The distance is exactly 180 degrees. So you can look through these and see from what resolution on you actually have only noise. Yeah. Um, so I guess this looks better, but this error bar should not be all the same as we just learned. Um, Anshi also created a tool that um, uh, quantifies the resolution. Um, in different tilt tilt angles and we tried to put this in and I think it works partly and I think we will hear more about that tomorrow morning. And in the end you make your final 3D map and this script um, will now make a map and the map by default is always two by two unit cells. And if you double click on this here then it's opening in Chimera by default, but you can set um, this also to other programs if you prefer O or Qt or something. Um, and Chimera, that one then would, um, would show you your map here. Yeah? So this is the, the map and then you have it in 3D. Um, so we produced two by two unit cells. We ran into one problem, which was Finally, we have a map that looks good. And of this map, there's also X-ray information available, so we can compare the map with the X-ray model. And the handedness was wrong. So the helices turned left instead of right when comparing our final map with the X-ray model. And so we were trying to find out where we did something wrong with the handedness. And we went back from to the tilt geometry definition and to every single step through the programs. And we also created synthetic images that contain text that you can read and we made sure that you can read the text in every step of all the processing steps. Before and after CTF correction, you always want to be able to read the text from left to right and not from up to top to bottom or so. And I'm convinced that we do everything exactly as it's intended to be by Richard Henderson. I went to Richard Henderson on a meeting, on a conference and showed him everything and asked him for help. Um, the tilt geometry is determined as Richard Henderson defines it. Um, then we found out that um, Nico Gilgoyev's CTF tilt um, had used a different convention than Richard Henderson initially programmed and now CTF tilt uh, was changed by Nico and now uses the MRC convention. And I think we do everything as it's intended to be and the final map is left-handed. And so what we do here to calculate the final map then is we flip the Z coordinate from bottom to up, we invert it so that it's right-handed map. And as a result, the MTZ file um, that we get in the last step is still left-handed, but when we use the MTZ file with CCP4 to make a final volume, then we flip it and then it is correct. Just for testing, we still calculate the original volume without flipping it, which has the wrong-handedness. It's here, if you double-click it, you open the wrong-handedness in Chimera, just if you want to look at it before the flipping. Yeah? So this is another map that 
uh, is before the um, so it looks more or less the same but is mirrored yeah um, so as it's implemented now it's all consistent um, you can use the mtz file here to refine your tilt geometry for example the mrc software is consistent in itself and when you make a final map we flip the handedness um, we also then can cut a sub volume you saw before that there's uh, many many uh, so it's two by two unit cells and um, so this sub volume only cuts out one unit cell or one one sub volume out of this yeah, so which is then much much smaller it makes more sense to look at that one molecule in the end and every crystal has a different um, sub volume if you would just want to look at one molecule and so we gave these nicknames which is Julia's program pro, uh, project Fabian's and Alex's and there's also others and it's easy to add more um, this is used by a script here which is um, I think this one this calculates crops out the sub volumes so there's just it's using the CCP4 program map rot and it's just rotating the final map a little bit and transposing it and then cutting out a subsection um, according to some custom made dimension so that you just get your one molecule out of your unit cell um, and we have three systems here but you can then in the end just add your own version four or five um, if you have a different molecule that happens to have different dimensions so then you can look at one molecule in chimera rapidly and you don't have to look at the unit cell each time so lattice lines model so what you have to check in the end is um, is the tilt geometry of all the images correct you can verify this with different means um, yesterday at the practical we tried a few you can look at the images you can look at outliers in your lattice line plots this is one thing you have to think about in some cases you can use switches that are in the MRC program uh, one switch for example reverts H and K um, and essentially flips the crystal upside down another switch uh, rotates your final map by 180 degrees um, there are many other switches and you can see if some of your images need some switches applied and for that um, we have a program or a script to refine switch in 3x merge that um, you can use to activate a test for one of these switches <coughs> if you have 100 images of clip f and they can lie down like this or like that on your crystal in the beginning you don't know uh, which image is which if you would activate this ref hk switch the script would align for every image align it once like that and once like that and see which version gives you better face residual and then stays with that version that gives you the better face residual and it would do this for all images and then set the ref hk value to on or off um, depending on what gave the better face residual and you can do this for all kinds of switches um, in the end you have to actually this is something i'll come back to later so in the end you have to um, see up to what resolution you can trust your values and look at the quality and she will tell us more about quality evaluation tomorrow and um, just now she said our factors need to be smaller than 40 percent and uh, weighted face residuals should be smaller than 20 degrees in the ideal case so you can have a look at that and she also programmed a tool that lets you estimate um, how large your missing cone is or in which tilt angle do you need more data sometimes you have lots of data at low tilt angles and up here it's very thin uh, or the opposite may be the case we have lots of high angle tilts that go only to low resolution and here it would be nice to have a few low angle tilts to reach higher resolution in the horizontal direction yeah. and Anji programmed a tool that makes a nice plot in the end that uh, lets you understand in one glance of in, with one image 
where you have missing regions and so you better go back to the microscope and set it to this tilt angle in that condition and take more images there. Um, the handedness of the 3D map <coughs> I think is now consistent. The MSC world pr produces an MTZ file which is left-handed but it's good to refine everything using MRC programs. But if you move over to CCB4, you have to flip the map and then the handedness shows up correctly, at least as we have it implemented. And I don't see any mistake that we have there. Um, and then you have an MTZ file, which is left-handed, but it's good for MRC programs, which um, you can use as a reference to refine the entire processing. And that's a very powerful thing. But you can limit this MTZ file for the reference to a reasonable resolution. If you think your final map has um, noisy six angstroms, then maybe you can limit this reference MTZ file to nine angstroms, just to have something rock solid that is true and has almost no noise, and then use this nine angstrom limited MTZ file as reference to refine the phase origins. That's the easy part. Yeah? So we want to do this three emerging. But you can also refine the tilt geometry in 2DX Merge using Oric Tilt. You do this by just telling 2DX Merge yes or no, refine tilt geometry yes. And then while looking for the phase residual for one image in the 3D map, it also says, okay, it's 45 degrees, but maybe a little bit higher or lower tilt angle would actually be better. And it, Oric Tilt will then start varying slightly the tilt geometry to see if a slightly different angle would fit better. Um, you can also use this MTZ file to refine the defocus. Um, and also the beam tilt can be refined, but that is um, a sensitive topic where you need a very solid reference, um, which you can really trust, um, so that beam tilt is not uh, accidentally interpreted as astigmatism or so. So to see the difference for the Programs between astigmatism and beam tilt requires high resolution and good signal to noise ratios in the data. So this beam tilt I would only touch if you're at the very end of all your processing and before you touch it you could also just back up all your configuration files. Then try beam tilt refinement and if things completely go berserk and everything goes crazy and the program tells you you have 90 degree tilt angle and a beam tilt of, of something astronomic then you go back to your backup. Um, leave the beam tilt at zero for the time being. Yeah? Beam tilt is a topic that um, is prepared and should work, but um, you need a very high resolution data set for that. Um, these refinement switches are in 2DX Merge. Um, showing the refinement. There is here, refine tilt geometry, yes or no. And if you say set this to yes, then it will do a few steps um, at, at certain increments and, and cover. So if you say 45 degrees is one image, it will say in this case for the tilt angle plus minus five degrees. So it goes from 40 to 50 in half a degree steps and sees if there's something better to, to find. And the tilt axis can also be slightly varied and, and, and seen if you get any better results. Um, so the final the final MTZ file was where is that? Um, that's from the merge. The final MTZ file is is here. MTZ lattice line data for reference. And if you double click that it's uh, dumped into a text file with MTZ dump, which is then open in a browser, and you can look at this MTZ file, um, which is a CCP4 file, and it has the reflection number and amplitude and the phase and the figure of merit um, information and the sigma phase. Um, and you can look through that, and that's your reference. And this is the file, the MTZ file, that can be used by other programs to refine, for example, the defocus. Yeah. Um, so you can just open any image and then down here on the left there is refine parameters. 
Uh, no, where's this? Refine the defocus, for example. Yeah. If you use the 3D reference MTZ file to refine the defocus, um, at the moment it says the defocus for this image is 11,000 and 12,000. If I run this, then very fast. It started with 11,000 and 12,000, 11,600 and 12,400, and it ends with 11,400 and 12,100, slightly different defocus values. And what happened here is that it looks at the final data and compares it with your 3D MPZ file and slightly varies the defocus and says, actually, the face visible is or, um, the cross-correlation value, I think, the correlation value. Um, between this data and your reference looks better if I slightly vary the, the drawn rings. Yeah. So this, this works and it's relatively reliable with a 3D MTZ file. And using these custom scripts here, you can also program it so that on all selected images this defocus is refined automatically. Uh, you just say this, what I just did, I want to do this on all selected images by yeah, you, you have to call to the X image with this one script. It's not, not in here. You just have to do this and take this hash mark out. And then you can call this refine defocus on all selected scripts. Yeah, you can refine the ton rings for all images, making use of your final MTZ file here, this one. And all kinds of refinement things for defocus, for... Um, Field geometry and so is now all implemented in Rotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is it optimal to actually do this in a special way? Because you know, we have different complexity. If you want to have a field vision of views of, you know, go back to the antithesis and see if there are any checks or checks in between. Um, yes. Really yeah, we do that. And so, for example, here in this case, the, the beginning images, they are all non-tilted, zero, yeah, so here's zero, zero. And the tilt axis and tilt angle were all at zero. But now this program said, well, actually there is a little bit of tilt angle, yeah. This one was four degree tilted, this was 0 0.9 degree tilted, this one was minus 2.5, this one minus five, yeah, I'm not sure if that's true. I would have to check the face residual. Um, this is now a high resolution setting included. So, but if you go to low resolution, you get better face residual. But all these nominally non-tilted images actually gave better face residuals under a little bit of tilt. And this also shows how non-flat our carbon film usually is. We are not good at making flat carbon films. I think this was even cryo-EM and not, um, not on carbon. Yeah? So where we think we have non-tilted data, we actually have up to five or six degree tilt. Yeah, and probably this, this varies even within one crystal. Yeah. Um, so here on the left, you see that all the 15 degree tilted images, they all have the tilt axis around 60 degrees and the tilt angle was plus 15 from this session. But the tilt angle actually refined better if they were more than 20, between 13 and 20 degree. Yeah, so this is all after refinement. Any other questions? This is a vast topic and this, this 3D merging. And I think the technical difficulties of all this is the reason why there were so many projection maps that never made it into 3D. And we hope that um, with this and further also advancing all these methods, this learning curve can be much faster now. So that once you have crystals, within a few months, you should be able to publish a 3D structure of the same resolution as your 2D pictures are. Yeah. So it should be maximally three months. If not, you have to yell at us and say, you didn't explain something right, or this is always crashing or something doesn't. I can't understand this here, which means we didn't make it self-explanatory enough. <coughs> yeah. So, okay. This is what I wanted to show you. <laughs>